Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Dr. G. S. Raju from the University of uh, Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, this is Zoom class six uh, on July 5th. And uh, this is uh, mainly to help the first year fellows who are going to start their endoscopy uh, starting this month. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. John Stoline, Charles Butt, Angela Deal, and my institution for the support. And uh, these are the objectives that we will be covering. And uh, at the outset, I would like to share with you uh, this uh, video uh, should have been recorded as part of the Zoom class that we have. Uh, every Sunday at 8 o'clock Central, Central Standard Time. But uh, uh, today we had a little bit of a problem in recording the class. And I would uh, also want to thank my panelists, Dr. Selvi Tirumurthy, who is on faculty at uh, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and uh, Dr. Zubair Khan, uh, current uh, fellow, uh, senior fellow at uh, the University of uh, Texas Houston program, and uh, Miss uh, Laura Romero, uh, senior uh, tech and the chief tech at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center Endoscopy Unit. Now, we had a lot of discussion. I wish uh, uh, we had that recording. I apologize for this inconvenience. But for the sake of fellows, I would uh, like to record it again, and that's why I'm recording. And uh, let me uh, take you through this uh, uh, process. Uh, as you enter the endoscopy unit, uh, you are at risk for infection. And uh, these risks currently, we are in the middle of a COVID uh, pandemic, and uh, that is uh, spread predominantly by droplets and also by aerosol. So we have to take every precaution to protect ourselves from getting infected during this COVID pandemic. And the same principles that we learn today and also as we practice protecting ourselves against COVID will apply when the flu season comes. And in addition to the droplet and aerosol transmission, um, Endoscopists are at risk for C. difficile and MRSA, which are spread predominantly by contact transmission. And finally, sharp injuries could result in HCV infection. And if you're not protected against hepatitis B uh, with a vaccination, that is another risk, and also the risk of HIV. So, Let's talk about uh, COVID-19, because we are right now in the midst of COVID-19, and there's a huge surge of cases, in uh, not only in Texas, but also in different parts of the country, as well as around the world. Uh, COVID-19 is spread predominantly by air, either droplets or uh, airborne or aerosol, and also uh, spreads by contact. And uh, the three simple principles to protect yourself mm -hmm. from infection is number one, uh, maintain the social distance of at least six feet or more. Number two, uh, wear proper PPE, depending upon the type of work you do, and uh, learn how to uh, remove PPE properly, and number three, uh, practicing proper hand hygiene. Now, these three principles are the most important thing, and uh, we do care for patients, whether they have COVID or whether, whether they have COVID or not, we care for patients. But in the process, COVID has certainly uh, given us an opportunity to practice infection prevention principles right. And for the batch that is starting endoscopy 
in 2020, uh, this uh, makes uh, even more uh, sense. So let us talk about the first uh, principle, uh, that is uh, hand hygiene. And I've been in the endoscopy unit uh, and practicing endoscopy for quite some time, but I thought that I knew how to do hand hygiene. But as I was preparing for the endoscopy tech training program uh, for the last uh, three, four years, as part of the program, uh, we created these uh, images to help uh, the technicians learn the basics. And that actually helped me learn how to do hand hygiene properly. And uh, you should do hand hygiene uh, before you touch the patient and after you've touched the patient. And whenever uh, there is a doubt, uh, you should uh, do hand hygiene. And before you think about touching your face or your nose or your eyes or rub your eyes, uh, stop, uh, do the hand hygiene, and then do whatever you need to do. Uh, the hand hygiene is not simply uh, washing your hands with uh, soap and water or with a hand sanitizer. Uh, there is a particular sequence of steps that you need to follow, and you have to follow these steps uh, religiously uh, so that you cover all aspects or all uh, areas of your hands that could be contaminated by infectious material. Although the recommendation is to do hand washing uh, for at least 20 seconds, the most important thing is to wash your hands properly following the steps as outlined in this uh, figure. Uh, for the sake of uh, uh, the first year fellows, uh, let me take you through uh, these steps one by one. Uh, take uh, a good amount of uh, soap onto your hands and with a little bit of water, uh, rub the palms uh, to create a nice uh, lather. Uh, that's how you uh, clean on the palms and then go to the backs of the hands and uh, in between the webs of the fingers on both hands. And then you go in between the fingers uh, and then inside the fingers, followed by uh, making time to uh, work on the webs of the thumbs and finally the tips of the fingers. And uh, once you've covered all these areas, uh, you wash your hands uh, with water and then dry them. And after you've dried them, that's, uh, that towel is used to close the water tap. Don't close the water tap with uh, the hands. Instead, use uh, the towel to close the, the tap. Otherwise, uh, the, ta the tap area and the sink area may be contaminated and you've basically lost what you gain by washing your hands. The goal is to have a clean uh, and dry pair of hands. Dryness is most important. Unless your hands are dry, uh, you are going to carry the infection uh, around. So important to not only clean the hands, but you dry them. I want to repeat this thing again. There are multiple steps Take a little bit of uh, soap, work on the palms, then the back of the hands, the webs of the fingers, in between the fingers, inside the fingers, webs of the thumb, webs of the thumb, tips of the fingers, then wash, then dry, close the tap, and have a clean, dry pair of hands. So practice this, and uh, not a bad idea, if you have a friend or you have a partner, uh, teach them how to wash their hands properly. And for endoscopists who have a lot of stressful job, uh, doing this is like a Zen moment. You can cool down uh, and get rid of all the stress by carefully washing your hands and, uh, and uh, refocusing on something else other than the stress of endoscopy and taking care of patients. The same thing applies uh, with uh, hand sanitizer. Hand washing with soap is a must in patients with uh, C. diff, 
and whenever your hands are uh, grossly contaminated. But uh, irrespective of that, uh, wa hand washing is uh, probably much better than a hand sanitizer. Uh, but with the virus, people have shown that uh, you need to have alcohol-based hand sanitizer with the alcohol content of at least 65 to 75 percent alcohol uh, that's used in the hand sanitizer. Again, with the hand sanitizer, the steps are the same as you do for hand washing with soap and water. And uh, let us go through this thing one more time uh, so that you get uh, the feel for how to sanitize your hands. You may be thinking that I'm beating on the same aspect again and again, but this is the basic thing that you need to do uh, before you become an endoscopist. This is how you prevent yourself from getting infected and staying safe for the long haul. Uh, I've known friends who got infected uh, with uh, C. diff. I've known friends who got infected uh, with other infections. So uh, make sure you learn to do this thing properly. So with a hand sanitizer, uh, take an adequate amount of uh, the material, work on the palms, back of the hands, and the webs of the fingers, in between the fingers, inside the fingers, webs of the thumbs, tips of the fingers, and then finally make sure that you have dry hands. You don't want to, once you have hand sanitizer and you rubbed a little bit, it doesn't mean that you got the job done. You need to let that hand sanitizing uh, material dry your hands. That's when uh, you can take it that you have done it right. All right? So make sure that you keep these things in mind. The next thing is uh, PPE. Uh, although before COVID, I thought that I knew how to wear PPE and remove PPE. Uh, COVID has certainly taught me a lot more lessons in uh, uh, making sure that I uh, focus on minute details, which are very important to prevent getting contaminated. You know that COVID virus can stay on different surfaces for, for quite some time. It can stay on uh, paper for a day or two. Uh, it can stay on uh, metal and plastic objects for three to four days. So, uh, and uh, on any of the PPE outside, you can have the virus because during endoscopy, splashes can happen uh, that may be obvious to you, but uh, more often than not, splashes that happen are not obvious and they can cover uh, your gown, your face mask, uh, your gloves, uh, all the PPE that you wear. Uh, so it's very important to wear PPE, and it's also very important to remove PPE properly. So let us look at PPE. So you have uh, different aspects, uh, different elements of PPE, and then let us look at how do you don these uh, PPE elements. First, you put a hairnet to cover your hair and, uh, if possible, ears. Then, an impermeable gown uh, that covers your torso. Then, a face mask to cover your mouth and nose, and uh, with or without a shield. Or, you may use an N95 mask if you are worried about aerosol type of procedure. And then, eye protection with a face shield or goggles, and finally, protection of your hands with gloves. So that's how, that's the sequence you use. And let's look at the, the details. When you wear a gown, you want to make sure the gown actually fits properly. It should go all the way, uh, cover the arms all the way to the wrist, and the body from neck to the knees. A short gowns are not going to be of help. So make sure that you have a proper size gown. Number two, so make sure the mask fits well from the bridge of the nose to under the chin. You should cover both the nose and the mouth. It's not just the mouth. 
so that's how you prevent uh, others getting infected and you prevent you protect yourself from getting infected by closing off covering both uh, the nose and the mouth so uh, then you have to wear uh, the eye eyewear uh, to cover your eyes and finally you went you want to wear gloves and the gloves should go over the wrist and over the gown and uh, it's this is important you don't want to wear a pair of gloves and then your skin is uh, seen between the end of the glove and the end of your gown so you want to wear a gown a glove that goes over the gown so we we talked about how to wear ppe and uh, depending upon the type of work that you do if you can uh, think about uh, you're going to have uh, you're in the on the floor and uh, there's a risk of either droplet and contact transmission you wear this uh, attire a hairnet face shield or goggles surgical mask impermeable gown gloves and shoe covers and uh, if there is a risk of airborne transmission especially if you're doing an egd or a colonoscopy both are air, airborne uh, procedures then you wear hairnet face shield goggles or goggles and instead of a surgical mask you go to n95 mask and you have to have n95 mask fitted properly and you need to check every time you put your n95 mask whether there are any leaks and the way you check is once you put your n95 mask you take a little bit of a deep breath and see whether the mask uh, uh, t tends to collapse and uh, if you puff a little bit of air and see if the air comes out by the sides so if there is something problem you need to get uh, a better fitting mask uh, then impermeable gown gloves and shoe covers so say for example you finish the procedure how do you remove uh, the ppe and there is a sequence to remove uh, you go and remove your gloves and then goggles i'm sorry remove your gloves then your gown then then the goggles then the mask and the hairnet and how do you remove your gloves there is a technique for removing gloves properly without getting your hands contaminated you peel the uh, one glove with the other hand and keep your wrist closed and then with the other uh, hand uh, that has been ungloved the fingers should go underneath the uh remaining glove at the wrist and then uh pull it over the first glove the most important thing is you do not want to touch outside the second glove and you discard the gloves in waste container that is dedicated for infectious material that means it should go into the red uh bins that we have in endoscopy units that are designated for infectious material following the removal of the gown it is an important thing to do hand sanitization and if for some, for some reason you made a mistake that hand sanitization is really critical to protect yourself then you remove your goggles when you remove your goggles you do not want to touch the front of the goggles you hold uh the sides and then gently uh, remove it uh, if it is uh, reusable you put it uh, in an area where you can reuse after cleaning it out with uh, a germicidal uh, wipe uh, if it is not reusable you need to dispose it off in a waste container that is dedicated for infectious material then then again you want to get into the habit of uh, hand sanitization it's very important to do hand sanitization after every step of doffing then when you're uh, removing the gown you want to uh, ask somebody to untie uh, the neck and waist ties 
Uh, that way you will not, uh, somebody who unties should have a clean glove, clean glove and untie. And if you want to untie yourself, make sure that you hand sanitize your hands before you untie. And then once you've done that, you want to pull the gown away from the body from inside out and turn the gown inside out and dispose it off in the waste container for infectious material. If it is a reusable gown, you put it in a separate bin. So the key again is to not touch the front of the gown that will have splashes of the virus that you may not see. So once you remove the gown, again, make it a point to hand sanitize. And then the last thing is to remove the face mask. And how do you remove the face mask? You untie the bottom uh, tie first, not the top one. If you go ahead and untie the top one, the mask is going to fall onto your clothes and it will contaminate your clothes. So you untie the bottom one and then bend forwards and then untie the top uh, tie and let the mask uh, fall into a container designated for infectious material. So let me take you through what I do uh, in the endoscopy unit. So after I've done with the procedure, I hold my scope, I ask my assistant to have a clean pair of gloves and close the computer uh, with a clean pair of gloves. That's how you, he ends the procedure. And then I hand over my scope to him and then I walk to the right. Uh, this is the wall that is opposite to the door, right? It's uh, across the door. And uh, I remove my pair of gloves and I use a hand sanitizer that is set up there, hand sanitize. And then I remove my uh, gown inside out, complete the hand sanitization one more time. And then I come to uh, the, the, uh, the area that is closer to the door where I have a sink and I wash my hands and then I remove my uh, face shield and uh, let it drop. And we typically are using an N95 mask and a face shield on top of that. Uh, so after I've removed that, I still have my N95 mask. And then I come out of the, I come out of the room and then hand sanitize again, and then I remove my N95 mask. And uh, what I've been doing is, uh, I watched a video uh, by a nurse from New York uh, where she has shown uh, that it is easier to remove your N95 mask by using a, a lunch box. You put your head into the lunch box and remove uh, the elastic bands on to the lunch box and you will not touch the front of the N95 mask. And once I've done that, I hand sanitize and I put my uh, surgical mask and then go about doing whatever I need to do. So you have to get into this habit of doing things right. So what are the principles of protection? I think uh, for all of us, uh, we need to learn how to wear PPE, uh, the proper PPE, and we also have to practice proper doffing. That's where majority of the mistakes happen. You may not realize this. You have to practice proper doffing, whether it is for droplet or for airborne infections. And uh, as you can see here, uh, I put uh, this image again to make it a point for you to get into the habit of frequent hand washing. And uh, before you go and work at the computer, uh, not a bad idea to use a germicidal wipe to clean that area uh, before you start working. And uh, uh, when you uh, talk to the patient, uh, try to maintain the social distance and also uh, make sure that as soon as the procedure is done to put the face mask on the patient to prevent uh, spread of infection. Although at our institution we are testing patients and not doing anybody 
uh, with a positive test uh, for elective procedures. Uh, but it's different for an emergency, we take care. But for elective, we differ doing the procedures. I have to keep uh, say this, none of the tests are perfect. So you have to take all the precautions. So let me, because this is a first year, uh, for, uh, I'm focusing this talk for the first year fellows. And I want to give you an introduction about endoscopy unit, uh, patient flow, and uh, also uh, endoscope flow, what happens to the endoscope. So when the patients come in, uh, they come into the reception area and then uh, they, they get registered and the nurse takes them to the preparation area, prepares the patient, uh, and then they go into the procedure depending upon the type of the procedure and finally uh, they get back to the recovery and then they go home. Uh, the and on the back side is the scope cleaning area that we will talk about. Before COVID, patients were always accompanied by their relative. Uh, you see them uh, when they come in, and you see them when they recover, when they take them home. But COVID has changed the whole uh, paradigm of care. And uh, I would like to talk about that uh, for your benefit. So if you look at it, Previously, we used to make a phone call uh, to touch base with the patients and talk about management of their medications, uh, their prep for colonoscopy, and also their antithrombotics, et cetera. But now, we include uh, checking about their COVID symptoms, and we routinely arrange for their COVID test. And uh, based on the symptoms and tests, we decide uh, what to do with those patients. And uh, uh, once they come in, uh, previously people could uh, sit in uh, in a crowded area, uh, but because of the COVID, uh, we maintain social distance of at least uh, six feet. Uh, they, when they come into the hospital, they wear a mask. And now uh, we are in the midst of a surge uh, in Texas. Uh, the governor... Uh, uh, the governor's orders are to put a mask when you go into the public, so patients are coming with masks. But one thing is, uh, cloth masks are different. Uh, they, they don't provide the same protection as the surgical mask. So every patient that comes into the hospital at MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, they go through a list of questions uh, to screen them, and their temperature is checked. And they were and all of the patients are given a fresh surgical mask. That is also true for all the employees entering MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, uh, we all uh, answer a series of questions. Uh, our temperature is checked, and we are given a fresh surgical mask as we enter. So, as you can see here, all the patients are sitting there with a surgical mask, and the temperature is checked and the COVID test result is checked again to make sure it is negative uh, because sometimes the tests can be pending and uh, by the time they come, they may, may not have the final test. Uh, if the test is negative, we go ahead and do the procedure. If the test is positive, the physician will discuss uh, the pros and cons and make a decision uh, whether to go ahead or not. So once the patient comes into the preparation area, uh, the nurse uh, does the uh, pre-op, uh, puts in the IV, and puts in the EKG leads, uh, blood pressure cuff, and, uh, and uh, oxygen monitor, etc. The physician goes and uh, talks to the patient. Uh, again, uh, gets the consent. The anesthetist does the same. And the nurse takes the patient into the room. In the past, before COVID, we had the uh, privilege of having patients' relatives accompany them into the pre-op area so we could talk to them. And now, unfortunately, uh, uh, the hospitals, uh, for the right reasons, limit the number of people coming into the hospital. So the patient may come. Uh, and as you can see here, there is no attendant. When there is no attendant, the patient is coming for a procedure and the anxiety level is much higher 
So something to keep in mind. And it's also important that uh, as you uh, approach the patient, think about your social distance. Make sure that you stand at the foot end of the bed uh, that gives you at least six feet, a few, a few feet away from the foot end of the bed that gives you adequate protection and make sure that the patient has a surgical mask and you have a surgical mask and uh, whatever you need to uh, uh, discuss with the patient, maintain that social distance. Uh, of note, uh, what I've been doing now, uh, because the patients are anxious, I ask the patient about uh, the, the one that is waiting for them outside. Most of the relatives are waiting in their cars in parking lots or other areas. So I call the patient's relative, I put the speakerphone on, and uh, reassure them that I will take care of their, rel of their loved one. And I tell them that I will call them after the procedure. So this will help uh, the patients to be a, a little more comfortable that you do care. And uh, I urge you to get into the habit of reaching to the patient's relative before you do the procedure and after you have done the procedure. Uh, think about yourself. If you have a loved one going for an endoscopy, you're sitting outside in the car park. So once the patient goes into the room, uh, for the first year fellows, I want you to know it is like an operating room. You have the patient's bed, you have an endoscopy tower, it's a tech uh, prep table, uh, anesthesia machine, uh, or anesthetist, or a, or a CRNA, and a nurse with a computer, and a different equipment in the back, and uh, different containers for disposing waste, uh, biohazard waste, as well as shops. So when you go into the room, uh, get into the habit of seeing how the room is set up, and uh, whether it is set up uh, for you and for your team to do the proper doffing of the PPE and hand hygiene in a, a systematic manner. So. I want to make a few comments about how endoscopy has changed uh, before COVID and after COVID. So before COVID, you know, typically in a teaching hospital, there are several people involved in the care of a patient. Uh, and when you can see here, there's no social distance. And uh, most patients had a nasal cannula for oxygen. Nasal cannula, oxygen delivery, is an aerosol generating procedure. If you put your oxygen to five liters, you can have aerosol going up to five to six feet. So keep that thing in mind. So with the COVID, uh, things have changed. Uh, the number of people in the room uh, has been limited. And as you can see here, uh, instead of nasal cannula, the anesthetists are using a face mask to limit the spread of the uh, aerosol and uh, in emergency procedures uh, intubation you know, to protect uh, further. After the procedure may, we should take time to clean uh, the area and uh, you know that you know the whole bed is going to be contaminated the surrounding area is going to be contaminated and it is your uh, the team's duty to clean the bed with the germicidal wipe before the patient is taken to the recovery area because the recovery nurse expects that you have cleaned the bed. Otherwise, you're going to get the recovery nurse uh, get exposed to infection uh, from the bed. So make sure that you, pr you practice uh, uh, proper uh, preventive measures. It's not just wearing the mask, but it's also taking care of other things including preventing infection from fomites. So that is from contact. That means cleaning the surface. So once the patient uh, goes into the recovery, as you can see here, uh, the nurse recovers the patient. Once the patient is awake, uh, as an endoscopist, you go and talk to the patient. But most of them may not remember much. So that's why I urge that you take your phone and call the patient's relative. Tell them what happened and what needs to be done. Uh, don't worry about 
uh, too much about your phone number being available to everybody. I've given my phone number to all my patients and very few bother uh, me unless they have a need. So you will do a lot more service by making that phone call to the patient uh, relative who's waiting out there anxiously. So let me uh, talk about the journey of a scope, what happens to the scope after the procedure is done. So depending upon the type of the procedure, it could be just an EGD or a colonoscopy, ERCP, EUS or enteroscopy. Once the scope is done, uh, the technician takes care of the scope. Uh, they do a little bit of pre-cleaning immediately after the scope comes out of the patient's body. And then they take it to the disinfection area. Uh, they do a leak test first and then manual cleaning in the sink and then inspect the scope for any damage before it goes into the high level disinfection followed by a storage uh, after drying the scope and then it goes back into the another patient. So we will talk about this in the next uh, few talks. My next talk is going to be on the structure of the endoscope and uh, we will talk a lot more about uh, these aspects uh, a few weeks from now. It's also important to manage exposure, not only just during COVID, but uh, irrespective of the COVID. I think uh, whenever somebody gets exposed, it's important to inform the manager and employee health if there is one in the hospital or in your facility. You need to talk to somebody who knows how, how they can manage your exposure and you begin, begin preventive treatment and if necessary, if necessary, and comply with the treatment, whatever treatment that is recommended, and monitor for adverse events. I hope this uh, talk has been useful to you. And uh, we will have another Zoom talk next Sunday, and that is on endoscope structure, so that you can appreciate uh, what the engineers have done to make this beautiful device called the endoscope. Thank you.